that this we know. This conference will now be recorded. So once this is completed, we do understand what is what what is HL7, what is HL7 message structure for each message type. We need to practically implement that. That is when we will go ahead and start looking at Mirth Connect. So we'll work, uh, we'll understand Mirth Connect is nothing but one of the healthcare integration engines out there in the healthcare industry. Um, so uh, we have other engines as well, like Rhapsody, Ensemble, Cloverleaf, CorePoint, Iguana, and uh, and Qvera. So there are many others, uh, many other competitors in the market, but <clears throat> the advantage with this is this is a freeware and uh, very robust not like um, small interface engines which are not very famous in the market Mirth, Mirth integration engine has been in the market for past uh, 15 20 years and it is uh, it is being used robustly for small clinics as well as huge enterprises so the scalability is also there the uh, the ease of working with Mirth connect is also a lot in the healthcare industry which is why many people prefer to use it so as part of mirth integration engine we will see the basics architecture of mirth connect integration engine and what are the uh, core concepts and what are the core components of mirth connect so we'll have a quick overview overview of the entire application workflow so that we can navigate through the application and understand uh, what all options we have and then we will jump into uh, jump a little bit <clears throat> deeper into what are the components that we have uh, what is summary tab what is source tab what is destination tab and we will jump into uh, the concepts of variables and all with respect to mirth connect well, the scope of variables in mirth connect is a little different so we'll take a look at what are the various uh, scopes of variables that we have and then we will be talking about what are the message uh, what are various messages that are formed that are created when a message is traveling through Mirth Connect? After looking at the architecture, we'll get a fair understanding of how the message travels through certain interface and what are the different kinds of messages that we'll see when a message is traveling through an interface. Then we'll have a basic understanding of networking because this is necessary as we as integration developers or integration analysts, uh, we need to know how we are getting connected to two different systems on either sides uh, being a middleware uh, mirth connect integration engine connects system a to system b but how it connects to system a on one side and how it connects to system b on the other side plays a very important role so understanding the basic concepts of uh, these networking aspects is necessary so we'll be going through those networking aspects and then we'll also uh, start creating channels so this is how we go ahead and get practical exposure uh, we'll create various kinds of channels uh, with folder to folder uh, and see how hl7 messages are uh, passed through when we create folder to folder type of interface and we'll also take a look at tcp ip type of interfaces and here we'll be touching about uh, how acknowledgement messages are created and sent back to the source system we'll have uh, some sort of simulator sending message through TCP IP to Mirth Connect and Mirth Connect transferring them to another TCP IP destination and we'll be seeing something called acknowledgement choreography which is part of our uh, certification process I mean one of the concepts of certification so we'll try to understand that by implementing in real time using TCP IP and then we'll also go ahead and create interfaces using database i have a demo database demo ehr kind of database which we'll be using for the purpose of training uh, so we'll go ahead and create an interface extract the data from database and then generate an initial seven message out of that extracted data and then we will also see about how to interpret an initial seven message and write the data to the database um, and on the, and this is on a very basic level and we will jump a little bit deeper once we understand about JavaScript. So JavaScript is a necessary concept that we need to know about uh, if you want to implement an interface with Mirth Connect. Uh, but as you know, as most of us might not be from HL7 uh, healthcare IT background, 
so I do cover basics of JavaScript which is needed for implementing an interface in Merth Connect. So we'll have two sessions on that. And then we'll also be covering about uh, Merth Connect transformers. That is when we're, we will take a deeper look at how to write JavaScript loops if conditions to interpret an HL7 message or to generate an HL7 message from, from the data that got extracted from database. So finally, uh, We'll complete the uh, Merth Connect training with uh, alerts and we'll also um, you guys can uh, as and when we go through the sessions you guys can start uh, working on the exercises. So I'll, I'll let you know how to go ahead and uh, work through those exercises to get some practical exposure. So that would be the summary of the course content which you are going through uh, which would be going through. So we'll start our today's session with uh, the basics that as I said, we'll go through hospital workflow today. So by the end of uh, today's session, we will go ahead and uh, try and get a picture of what is uh, HL7, where do you hear this term? What is hospital workflow and why HL7 has come into play? We'll also see how the name HL7 has been given and uh, We'll see what is an interface and what is the role of interfaces, what is interoperability and HL7 message structure. So as part of structure, we'll see how HL7 message structure looks like and then we will uh, conclude today's session. So few general terms before we jump on further. Uh, so these are the basic terms that we'll be using most frequently, especially first uh, four or five uh, terms that you are seeing here. So these are acronyms. So whenever I refer to PM, uh, you need to understand what exactly I'm uh, referring to. So PM is a practice management system, usually um, a software that is used by the front end staff, or receptionist or uh, whoever is trying to register the patients in the hospital. So this is used to manage patient details, schedule appointments and all. And then we have EHR, which is electronic health record. And EHR system is a clinical a system which will store the entire patient clinical information on when the patient walked in and what treatment did he take at the hospital what are the medicines that have been that has been given to the patient all of these things are stored in EHR system next we have HIS which is hospital information system this is kind of combination of both EAPM and EHR which will have different modules for these two things and uh, you can manage your entire hospital using HIS Next LIS is lab information system which is used by laboratories to manage their entire laboratory and uh, there they will punch in their orders and they will uh, generate results and maintain their entire uh, orders and results within that clinical within that LIS software system. Then you have ICDs which is international classification of diseases. So uh, this is nothing but a library kind of thing where you'll have hundreds and hundreds of codes uh, for all the diseases that are there in the world. So each and every code represents um, one certain disease. So we call them as international classification of diseases. Currently we are running with version 10 of ICD. Then you have CPT which is current procedural terminology. So once a disease is diagnosed patient has to be treated right. So those treatments or whatever procedures that doctor is going to perform each of those procedures will have a certain code. So again, this is also a library of codes where you will where where you will see that all the different procedures that doctor would be performing uh, on a patient or whatever service they are providing uh, from hospital perspective each and every service will have a procedure code so that procedure codes are part of this CPT library. In CCDs, HIE and IHE. So these three are kind of uh, interrelated with each other. CCDs are continuity of care document. So after a patient gets discharged from a hospital, uh, he will get a summary document kind of uh, we call it as a CCD. Not specifically only when patient is discharged. It is not only given to patient, but also there are other uses of CCD which we will be talking about. And HIE is health information exchange. So these CCD documents are exchanged with HIE and IHE is integrating health enterprise. This is another standard within HL7 
uh, where you will see that uh, exchange of CCDs with HI happens through these IHE profiles or IHE standards. So the last three that you're saying, we will take a basic overview of this at the end of our training to understand what are the other healthcare industry standards that we have, uh, which we will be using to transact healthcare data between different systems. Will we also of uh, seeing what is FHIR a little bit, uh, what is fire, when did it start, what is what are what are the core components of fire, so that you can have a basic understanding of fire as well. So that's what we are going to um, see at the end of the training in the last one or two sessions. So now let us start uh, with hospital workflow. So the reason I take through the hospital workflow is that. Um, so that we can have the basic understanding of uh, the concepts of where exactly the HL7 starts. So we will be referring back to this blueprint of hospital workflow many times during our HL7 training session. Uh, reason being this is where the actual uh, events happen and HL7 is a result of the events that are happening in the hospital workflow or basically in the hospital. So we know that when a patient walks in, he walks into the front end staff or receptionist desk and they will ask about uh, ask about meeting a certain doctor, or certain department or something of that sort. Now the receptionist would go ahead and ask whether they have been here for the first time, been here before or whether they are coming in for the first time. And then if, they, if it is first time, let's assume that it's first time. They will collect entire demographic information of patient. So what does demographic mean? Uh, demographics is nothing but all the patient, basic patient stuff like his name, date of birth, gender, SSN or any other special ID, a government related ID and then you know, and then other basic stuff like whether they have insurance, uh, guarantor, who is the guarantor and uh, patient race, ethnicity and language. All of this basic information of the patient is captured and this we usually refer to as uh, patient demographic information. Once the demographic information is captured, they will save it in their system and then they will schedule an appointment for the patient. Then they will ask which doctor or which department they want to schedule an appointment for. They will do that and these appointments will be scheduled. Next, the patient will go to the provider provider is nothing but the doctor usually we refer to doctor as a provider and uh, they will interact with the provider to discuss about their problem and if doctor is able to diagnose just by looking at the patient well and good with the symptoms that he has if not then they will schedule uh, some sort of or schedule and they will uh, create a lab order and send and have the patient go to the lab get the test done and have the results back uh, to the provider. So the lab will perform the test, will send the results uh, back to the provider and provider will review them and then provide his prescription or perform the procedures that he has to perform. Once that is done, all the charges pertaining to the provider's visit and then labs and will be sent back to the receptionist desk. So basically I refer to it as receptionist so that uh, we can understand it from general workflow perspective, but it is not always essential that charges will be sent back to the receptionist. Uh, it might be sent to another uh, billing company or billing department, something of that sort. And uh, the receptionist or the billing department will go ahead and generate claims if it is an insurance visit and send it to the insurance company. Insurance company will uh, then uh, they will go ahead and uh, complete the claim process and then they will uh, provide the reimbursements to the hospital. So the information between the hospital and the insurance company is exchanged in a different healthcare stand messaging standard called X12, which is uh, which is not like our original zone version 2 that we are going to take a look at. So that's just for your idea. X12 is another messaging standard altogether. So, um, as I said, we'll be referring back to this workflow and these events very frequently when we are going through our Agile 7 uh, training. Now we'll try to understand what is the problem that we have and how Agile 7 has resolved it. 
so we spoke about pm ehr lab information system and all so these are three different applications which are used in the hospital and and in the lab so when we talk about applications the applications architecture is like we'll have a front end we'll have a back end for each of these applications right so front end is nothing but whatever application that you are seeing and back end is the database where the exact app, uh, information is stored uh, the application is just a window for us to go ahead and access the database and view the information in a very logical and systematic manner right so uh, when and this will be the architecture for all the different applications that we'll have the basic basic architecture now when a patient is being registered in the pm system you saw that there is a flow of data from the pm system to the provider and from provider to the lab from lab back to the provider and from provider and lab back to the receptionist and so on so data is flowing from one system to another system so that all the systems can be in sync with each other so in order for that to happen uh, the databases that we are seeing here in pm system and ehr system have to integrate between each other so that whenever a patient is registered in the pm system uh, the data will be committed to the database and this data should go over to the database of electronic health record system so that people who are viewing health record can know uh, what is the name of the patient what is the what are his basic demographic details and uh, when is his appointment and so on all of this information will be scheduled in the pm but eventually they have to be seen in the ehr so the data will flow over from uh, pm system to the ehr system but how exactly it is flowing and all we'll take a look at that later uh, so we have the solutions today but let's see what is what was the problem back in 1980s so when the data has to flow from this database to the database which is on the ehr side there has to be an integration engineer who can understand the database architecture and then um, go ahead and understand the database architecture of electronic health record as well and then transact the data from this database pick up the data whatever has been saved just now and send it to the electronic health record and insert the data there in the electronic health record database so a small example to understand is let's say we have three different people from three different countries uh, and if they have to interact with each other uh, let's say people from uh, us india and china if these three people have to interact with each other they have to understand their own regional language right for example indian guy has to talk with chinese guy or communicate with the chinese guy he has to learn Chinese and then talk to him or the Chinese guy should learn Hindi and uh, or uh, whatever regional language it is and then they have to talk to that particular person if it is a one-on-one -on -one communication then understood the person can learn and try to communicate and so on but what if he has to deal with 10 different persons from 10 different countries he should spend time in learning each of those languages and then try to communicate with the other person which is which is very difficult and which will take a lot of time to go ahead and uh, pursue and then um, communicate and achieve whatever they want to achieve but uh, the common solution was to have a general common language so we have english today which through which we are communicating all over the world uh, so i don't need to understand what their regional language is all that i need to understand is english and i can i should be able to talk in english with that there was a common language using which communication was happening it doesn't matter what the regional language is in the same way uh, the problem that we had here is if the pm has to integrate with ehr the integration engineers on both sides should have a fair understanding of uh, the database architecture so that they can write the queries and then insert the data into database if it is one database then they can understand it they can um, try to go ahead and implement an interface uh, so that they can exchange the data between these two databases but what if there is another database in play like our lab system or some other system or if we if the pm has to interact with 10 different ehr systems then what would be the case so understanding all the databases is a time consuming and tedious process and uh, 
I mean, basically, basically, it is difficult to understand uh, and create interfaces for all of these things. So, to overcome that problem, we came up with a common language called as HL7. I pref I I just call it as language in the initial session so that we can it is easy to understand it, but it is not any programming language or anything it is a messaging standard i just wanted to emphasize on that so hl7 has been emerged as a common medium of communication between these different systems so what happens in this scenario is the other person uh, who is on the hr side or the person on the pm side doesn't need to understand the architecture of the database at all the integration engineer on the PM side will extract the data from the database generate the HL7 message Which is a common medium of communication like our English language and then send that message over To EHR as it is a common messaging standard or common medium of communication the Integration engineer on EHR side will have a fair understanding of HL7 they will interpret the data from the HL7 message and insert that into their database. So what this has done is We don't need to explicitly discuss on what we are going to do uh, On I mean what what all data components that we are going to send in a message where we are going to send in a message and uh, how to um, What is the database architecture of the other end is not required to be understood we all that we need to do is generate HL7 message and send it over uh, and it is deemed that the person who is receiving it would understand it and and know where we have what data elements in that HL7 message and interpret that so that is how HL7 has emerged as a common medium of communication so it doesn't matter how many different destinations the PM system is trying to go and integrate with they will generate HL7 message they will send it the other person is supposed to understand it and interpret it and insert the data into the database so that's how hl7 has uh, taken birth um, so we'll understand what is an interface so now that we don't need to um, explicitly connect databases we are actually connecting uh, the patient pm system with electronic health record through an interface and exchange the data in the form of HL7 messages. So it doesn't matter which databases we are dealing with. So it is not database dependent. Um, you can extract the data from one database, convert it into HL7, and send it to another uh, application EHR, which is residing on a different database altogether. So the bridge, which is actually connecting these two applications, is called as an interface. And uh, you can assume that it is a bridge or a tunnel between two different applications. And there is a conversion of data from uh, from the normal extract that they perform from the database and convert it into HL7 and send it over to the destination. So the tunnel is usually we refer to as interface. So uh, establishment of HL7 started back in 1980s itself. Uh, so, but uh, the actual standard is released in 1997. Uh, 10 years after almost 10 years after uh, the inception of HL7 So as I said, it is a messaging standard which is used to go ahead and exchange data between different healthcare applications So that uh, there is a common mechanism of mechanism of data exchange So it is being used in uh, many countries um, as of now uh, the name HL7 has come into play from the concept of OSI model uh, as we can see here, uh, it is kind of called open systems interconnection model uh, I'll I'll tell you how the name how we arrived at that name in a while uh, Using OSI model, but it is being used in many different countries uh, more than 28 countries are using HL7 today uh, But it is extensively used in US uh, Which is far 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 developed than many other countries in different parts of the world uh, so we'll take a look at how did we arrive at the name of HL7. So if you uh, if you want to have more knowledge about OSI model, you can just Google it. But I'll give you a basic understanding of it. So we have seven layers in the OSI model. So basically, what OSI model is right now, I'm displaying something on my screen, right? But you're also seeing it in your system. 
how is that happening apparently uh, whatever i am displaying on my screen is being converted into physical packets and that is traveling through the interface so you can assume that behind your screen there are seven more layers and the last layer is your ethernet adapter that you are connected to your laptop and through that ethernet adapter these packets are traveling through the internet and they are interpreted back in your system and you are seeing whatever i am displaying on the screen so these seven layers play an important role in converting what i am showing in the front end into in the form of packets and sending it through the internet to your system so the first layer or whatever you are seeing on the screen is the uh, is the seventh layer which is the application layer whatever hl7 transactions that we make so what and whatever hl7 messages that are being generated everything is done in the seventh layer which is why we call it as hl7 so hl7 is nothing but health level 7 so representing the number seventh layer we have number seven and as we are dealing with health level data it is called as health level seven so uh, an overview of hl7 structure so like any other as i said i would like to call it as a language in the initial phase so that we can have a little bit better understanding like any other language hl7 has its own grammar and syntax we'll be seeing what are those uh, uh, grammatical syntaxes that we'll be using in a while uh, so hl7 version 2.3 is one of the famous versions that is being used uh, in the healthcare industry we have other versions like version 2.5 2.7 2.8 as well but you will see a lot of implementations with version 2.3 because it's been around in the market for a very long time and then we have more than 50 data types and more than 80 message types uh, to cover all the events and message uh, events and message types that we have in the healthcare industry and then we have more than 86 event types so little bit on history of hl7 so hl7 has emerged a lot uh, right back from 1980s uh, and uh, it has been evolved over a period of time so as i said 1997 version 2.3 was released so it took almost 10 years to release it as a standard it is being used unofficially in the healthcare industry but uh, they thought that we should have a standard and a body organizing how hl7 message should look like what are the rules and regulations to construct an hl7 message and all and they have released version 2.3 in 1997 and after that they have released 2.4 in 2000 2.5 in 2003 um, and 2.8 was released in 2014 so the current certification that is being given is based on 2.8 version uh, and uh, version 3 was also released but the uh, but the industry did not widely accept version 3 which is why you will not be seeing a lot of interfaces uh, based on version 3 reason being the entire messaging structure of hl7 has changed with version 3 and uh, uh, com into implementing an interface on version 3 has become a little complicated because of its structure and the most important point why it is not being used uh, extensively in healthcare is uh, the fact that it is not adding any new value so you move from one version to another provided it is providing some sort of new value right but agile 7 version 3 uh, provide uh, known that they have to change the entire implementation process they have to change the uh, it's not just that they have to upgrade from their existing versions it says that it's that they have to start a new implementation altogether with version 3 and it was not adding any special value all the work that the, that the hospitals needed was already being accomplished with version 2 uh, 2.x so uh, we'll see only handful of implementations in the industry um, only 5 to 7 to 8 percent of implementations the rest are still on version 2 and uh, even new implementations from different countries like uae australia uk india all are all are uh, acquiring version 2 itself no one is going for version 3 and then uh, then there came our fire uh, we fhr which we pronounce it as fire so many people ask different questions about fire whether it can replace hl7 uh, 
Uh, when I meant not an HL7, it doesn't mean that it is not an HL7 standard. It is an HL7 standard, but it is not something like version 2. Fire is built on a different scale altogether. Uh, it is all about APIs and resources, REST services, uh, REST APIs, and interacting with a system which will help you to go ahead and expose your data in the form of APIs. So fire is a different messaging standard altogether when compared with HL7 version 2 and a uh, lot many people ask me whether it can replace HL7 version 2 and, and other standards. Yes, it is being designed from a perspective to replace other uh, messaging standards like version 2 CCDs and all but I am not seeing that in the near future. It will take at least uh, 8 to 10 years to start implementations on that scale because as I said again, moving from one version to another version should add a value and FHIR is still in the nascent stages of its development. It is still kind of baby um, in terms of uh, uh, implementation from for implementation from fire perspective itself and replacing other standards will take a lot of time. There is a lot of evolution that's taking place with respect to FHIR which will take a lot of time to become a common standard. So it took 10 years for HL7 to become a standard and have a release in the same way FHIR uh, Fire is Fire resources are still evolving. They did not reach their maturity level and it will take time for it to reach maturity and then be used as an standard implementation altogether Then comes the part of replacement of older versions and that depends on the industry and uh, once they implement fire resources they might feel that uh, yes we can use these existing solutions to replace hl7 and all but again it's up to the practice hospitals uh, we are seeing a lot of implementations all over the world with hl7 version 2 still because fire is not up to the mark to be a replacement for uh, version 2. Next, we'll uh, look at the advantages. So uh, HL7 will help us to share medical data, demographic and billing data and all, and data transfer is in the form of messages. No special tools are required, uh, only uh, with specific to integration engine. Um, and then code is in ASCII format, which means you can read the code. If you look deep, even if you don't understand HL7, you will at least understand few parts of it. And if you know HL7, you will get a fair understanding of what data is being transacted. And as I said, as it works on the application layer, it is completely uh, operating system independent. So it doesn't matter uh, which OS you're working on and it will help you to connect from one's, any system to any other system. Then it will give you a lot of uh, access to OSS market, meaning from business perspective, there will be a lot of uh, huge scale businesses that can be executed with when when we are implementing HL7 interfaces. Why do we need this standard? So it will help you to minimize the implementation between two different systems and will help in sharing of medical data. And uh, as uh, HL7 transactions happen electronically, quicker payments, insurance payments and claims can be done and uh, interoperability will be enabled where apps can talk to each other and there is a greater safety for patient as well as there is a greater quality of the data that is being transacted between different systems so now let us take a look at uh, how hl7 messaging works so this works based on an event that is happening in the real-time world so we see that in we saw that in the hospital workflow when a patient walks in the receptionist would ask them whether they are visiting here for the first time or they have been there. If it is first time, they will capture the entire patient demographic details and save it into their system. Right. So once they save that information into the system, that is called as one single event. So one event has been completed. So that's a conclusion of an event. And that conclusion of an event has generated the necessity for that captured data to be sent from the PM system to the EHR system, right? So this demographic information should go over from PM to EHR so the doctor can also have that basic demographic information of that patient. So 
this event which has generated this necessity for data to flow from one system to another is called as a trigger event hl7 basically works on this concept of series of events that are happening in the real time world so a trigger event happened in the in the real world and that will generate the necessity for data to flow from one system to another patient appointment being scheduled as soon as the appointment is scheduled in the pm system and saved this information has to flow over to the hr so the doctor can know what are the appointments he has for that particular day in this way there will be many events series of events that will be happening in the hospital but the basic understanding is these events will convert into hl7 messages and will transact between system a to system b system b to system c and so on uh, from pm to ehr ehr to lab and from pm to uh, claim insurance claim or pm to uh, or ehr to pharmacy so there will be many sort of events that will be happening each and every event is generating one hl7 message so that is the basic core of how hl7 messages are generated it is completely based on the trigger events that are happening in the real time world so if we, if we can broadly categorize into uh, what happens in the hospital we can say that patient gets registered and then appointments are scheduled then labs are scheduled uh, at the doctor's desk and then once everything is done charges are sent back uh, to the pm system and all and then we will also see that pharmacies and insurances uh, which means prescriptions are done insurance claims are generated as i said pharmacies and insurances are not uh, dealt from hl7 perspective uh, they are dealt in the form of x12 and erx so we won't be taking a look at those messaging standards this training covers all the other uh, major groups that we are seeing here major categories that you are seeing here how hl7 messages are transacted for these things now let us take a look at uh, the anatomy of an hl7 message so this is just to see what is the structure of an hl7 message so a small example to understand it so let's say we have a rack in our house uh, and uh, within that rack we we have three different shelves each shelf is divided into different different compartments so the first shelf is dedicated for clothes second shelf is for books third one is for all is also for different kinds of books that we have then let's say there are two people in the house and one guy is going for a tour uh, one of the person goes for a tour and after leaving the house he realized that he did not take his t-shirt he calls the second person and he just says that can you get me my t-shirt the second person at home will go collect the t-shirt and he will give it to him if you observe the dialogue between these two people when the first person is talking to the second person he did not tell what is the location of the t-shirt he just told can you get me the t-shirt the second person went to the rack opened the rack from first shelf first compartment he took the t-shirt and went and gave it to the second guy how does the second guy know that um, the t-shirt is present there without the first guy telling it because in their house that is the common structure or common uh, design that they have designed that within the shelf uh, within the rack first shelf is dedicated for clothes and first compartment has t-shirts second compartment has trousers and so on hl7 also works similarly to this principle we have dedicated placeholders for the data that we have uh, from a healthcare perspective another example is uh, if you, if there is power outage at our house today we have our mobiles but before that uh, even if it is dark we used to navigate to the place where we put our candle and we just take the candle and lit it because we know that that is the dedicated location for the candle to be there similarly keys and all hl7 also works pretty much similar to the way, very same principle that there are dedicated placeholders for each and every data element that we are transacting so the structure of hl7 is designed something as you're seeing on the screen so we will see what is the structure of hl7 message by comparing to this so if you look at one hl7 message each and every hl7 message has a segment so hl7 message is divided into segments segments are divided into fields fields are divided into components components are again divided into sub components so if you have to represent the structure it would be something like this 
where you'll have multiple segments each segment will be divided into fields so segments can be considered as shelves and each field can be considered as compartments and each field will have some sort of data component okay so these data components will be in present in the fields components can be again divided into sub components so for now all that we need to understand is uh, till the level of components uh, sub components and all we'll take a look at that later so components are again divided into sub components as i said so that is the basic pieces of data um, that we'll be seeing but we'll take a look at an sl7 message structure to understand what is segment what is field today tomorrow we will see what are components how do we navigate through hl7 message and all so as i said in the beginning each and every hl7 each and every language will have their own structure so here uh, uh, we are going to take a look at the syntax or grammar of what hl7 message is so same like english language we have few punctuations with respect to hl7 as well so we give space between two words right when we are writing something we give space between two words if the if it is the end of the sentence we put a full stop and so on similarly in hl7 at the end of each segment there will be a segment terminator kind of full stop to let the receiver know that this is the end of the segment so cr carries written is the is the representation that is used to go ahead and say that this is the end of the segment so at the end of each and every segment you will see a carriage return uh, and then you have field separator this is kind of a space you have space between two words right in the same way two different fields are separated with the help of a space uh, with the help of a, a pipe we call it as a pipe and this is going to separate two data components or two not components sorry two data fields so two data fields are separated with the help of pipe next you have component separator so within fields we will have components which you will understand better when you look at uh, an example which we will look at in a in a few few minutes um, so field separator will separate two fields then you have component separator which will separate two components within the field and then you have sub component separator ampersand so we'll talk about that with an example later a reputation separator is still a we'll look at this as well with an example later and escape character is nothing but to escape certain character within that hl7 message so we'll take a look at an example for this too so first we'll understand uh, for now pipe and components so this is a sample hl7 message as you can see each and every hl7 message has uh, as i said in the beginning we have segments segments are divided into fields fields are divided into components and so on so we are seeing the segment structure here so this is one segment this is second segment third one fourth one and fifth one there are five segments here and each and every segment starts with a three letter acronym and that will tell you what kind of data will be transacted in that particular segment so this is called as message segment header this is called as event type and this is called as pid patient identification segment so before we look at other segments um, we'll look at pid because that is easy to understand uh, for us to go ahead and um, relate and understand very easily so let me pull this out i'll just specifically pull pid segment and we will take a look at it and research so i like to select this is not javascript uh, don't mistake it for javascript it says that the color combination is good i used to uh, so that it will show up very better and we can understand it easily so this is our PID segment that we are seeing, right? So PID is nothing but patient identification segment. And I told you that once we have the segment, each segment is divided into fields. So this is one field. Whatever we have between two pipes is called as a field. So you can assume this like this sentence, one space, and then you have this one, this entire information with a space and this information with a space and forming a sentence kind of thing 
this information with the space but these spaces are removed with the help of a pipe okay each and every data piece is separated with the help of a pipe and whatever is present between two pipes is called as a field so this is and these fields have a number okay so this is field number one this is field number two this is field number three this is field number four this is field number five and so on so we have a specific number of fields for each segment as per the HL7 design structure okay don't bother about how many number of fields that we have in each segment for now we'll take we'll talk about that later whether it is important to know how many fields we have or not so we'll we'll definitely explore on those grounds in the future but for now just understand that we will have x number of fields in one segment and each and every field will hold certain type of data element that we are capturing in the front end now when a patient walks in we do capture his patient name his date of birth his gender and his language his religion his phone number his address and all of these things right all of these basic demographic details are transacted in the pid segment so when these things are captured and saved in the database they have to be sent in the hl7 message as well right so they are sent within the pid segment in the hl7 message but each and if they are sent in the form of fields okay for example this one is patient name and let's count the number so whenever we want to navigate to patient name in an hl7 message we count the number of the fields that we have so this is field number one two Hello, can you guys hear me? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. yes, we are able to hear now. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I, I think I lost the connection for a second there. Uh, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, so we are looking at the field structure. So uh, where was I? Yeah, we were talking about this particular field. So we were counting through the field. So whenever we need to discuss about any field uh, we just count through those fields and here right now we'll focus on this one to understand um, how do we navigate to it so whenever we want to navigate to any specific field in the hl7 segment we call out the segment name so this is pid and then we put a dot there and then we count the field number so this is one two three four and five so this is field number five 
and field number five is dedicated for patient name. Patient name. So whenever you want to go ahead and call out a patient, uh, you use this uh, field number PID five to call out patient name. And then you have PID 11 for phone number. And then you have PID um, 7 for date of birth, PID 8 for gender. In this way, you have different dedicated fields for different different data elements or data pieces that you are actually capturing in the front end. For example, if you don't have any data in between, you don't fill it up with something else. It is always the case that PID 5 is for patient name, PID 7 is for uh, date of birth, PID uh, 8 is for gender. And if you don't have, for example, if you don't have date of birth, you leave it blank. We do, we are not bothered about uh, of moving the data that is there in next field to this field. So that clearly implies that each and every data field is dedicated for certain data piece from HL7 standard perspective. So this is how you navigate through any HL7 message that we have. And within the name that you are seeing here, within the name that we are seeing here, we also have separate separate components. So what is a component? Now, when we talk about the name, uh, we know that name is not just name. We, we have first name, we have last name, we have middle initial, then we have suffixes, we have prefixes. So there are many other things which are part of name. So to account for each one of them, we each and every uh, part of the name is again divided and they are called as components. So for example, if you're seeing here, we have test John. So this is the last name. This is the first name of the patient. And these are separated with the help of a component separator. So this is called as a component separator. And we number them as well. So this is, okay, let me, okay, can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah, we can see now. Yeah. So, sorry. So this is patient name, right? So patient name is again divided into uh, separate different different components. So this is last name. This is first name. And these two are separated with the help of a component separator here. Right? So, and they are also numbered again. So this entire field is numbered as five. And again, components are numbered as one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So when you want to specifically navigate to last name, you navigate as PID 5.1. So PID 5.1 is last name, PID 5.2 is first name, and so on. So this is the navigation process that we follow. So whatever uh, data element that we want to uh, navigate to, we just call out with the help of segment name and the field number and then the component number. So PID 7, this is 7, field number 7. If you count from the beginning, field number 7 is dedicated for patient date of birth. So PID 7 is for DOB and then PID 8 is for gender and so on. So in this way, all the data pieces that you are capturing in the front end in the application, everything will have a dedicated placeholder in the HL7 message. Okay. So now whoever receives this HL7, so this is universal. Now whoever receives this HL7 message, now now that you know, if you receive this HL7 message, you know that PID5 is patient name. So I'll pick the patient name from PID5. I'll pick date of birth from PID7, address from PID13, phone number from PID11, and so on. So that is where there we I don't need to explicitly tell the other person who is receiving HL7 message that you pick it patient name from this place patient date of birth from this place it is known that is how a standard will be helpful in cutting down the time of implementation so now that we understood what is the structure we'll explore more on the structure in the upcoming sessions uh, you might be wondering how do we know pid5 pid7 and all so we'll be exploring all the important data elements of each and every field each and every instance, the important fields that we need to know, and we'll talk about their functional aspects and all in the upcoming sessions for sure.
you might be wondering another thing is do we need to read through the hl7 by reading the numbers no we have special tools but in the beginning i would recommend that if you want to remember which field holds what kind of data um, so counting that will really help you to uh, memorize it but if you don't want we have other tools i'll display the tools tomorrow to show you what all to what all other tools that we have which we can make use of so uh, training and certification so uh, training and certification can be done by self study uh, and you need to read all chapters but uh, uh, specifically you have to complete chapter 2 chapter 2 and chapter 2b as i said certification is done by hl7 organization uh, that is the only body who are authorized to provide certifications you have to register and you have to get certified and then uh, exams are regularly held all over the world um, you can write it any time or you can write it from your home and you will get your certificate immediately so who can be trained so there are three categories basics intermediate and experts so uh, all the different different teams based on their uh, proficiency level and based on their requirement level can be trained so to summarize what we have seen today we saw that hl7 is mandatory for interoperability healthcare data can exchange only with the help of hl7 and uh, it is uh, a definite requirement in the healthcare industry without that healthcare data cannot be transacted and then uh, it is mandatory or many other uh, to enter overseas market from business perspective as well so uh, as you are learning hl7 that's really great uh, i think uh, it will really help for your um, future career as well so what we have seen today is very basic stuff of hospital workflow and then we did talk about uh, why hl7 how is the name uh, how is the name uh, we how did we arrive at the name of hl7 what is an interface where do we use hl7 and we also saw what is the basic structure of hl7 message and what is the basic principle of how hl7 messages are generated which is nothing but trigger events and we also explored a little bit on the structure what is segment what is field and what are the different components that we have as part of a field and how fields and components are separated with each other so tomorrow we'll explore more on uh, what are the different message types that we have what are the different events that happen in the real time world that can be converted into hl7 messages and we'll talk more about uh, message structure how do we use certain tools to view message structure and understand different fields and we'll start exploring on various message types if time permits tomorrow so that is all for today so if you guys have any questions you can come up with your questions uh, i'll open the session for questions Hello. Yeah, sir, sure, Prasad. Yeah, the JavaScript should be uh, basics, or you have to learn total basics. So uh, yeah. JavaScript is huge, right? So uh, we we have uh, I take you through the basic stuff that is needed. So we need at least till if conditions and loops. That is all. That is enough for uh, for. developing interfaces on merge integration engine okay in up, in upcoming days the fhr is going um, going the um, so main mm. role i think so uh it it will it will uh, for sure but not in the very near future as i said there are lot of resources in fhr which are still evolving so they are not i mean the standard that we have r4 r5 right now uh, only uh, handful of resources are completely mature uh, and rest of them are still rest of them still did not reach the maturity level so we have a scale of maturity level within fhr for each resource so to reach that it will take time so it will but it will take a lot of time okay Do you have any resources you recommend for the HL7 certification test? 
uh, I will be providing the documents that you have to prepare through uh, chapter 2 chapter 2 a chapter 2 B and I will also provide you the questions sample questions which you can go through for preparation of certification Okay, thank you You're welcome Will be the timing similar for the continuing sessions? Yes, yes, Chandrakant. So, so thanks for bringing that up. So sessions will be like we'll have a four week session, four to five weeks, based on uh, how we are uh, uh, proceeding with respect to our uh, practicals and all. So it will be 24 to 28 session program, daily one hour, five days a week, um, and uh, timing will be seven to eight Eastern. Uh, sorry, seven to eight AM IST and whatever Eastern time right now. So it's the same time every day, one hour, 50 minutes, we'll have session, 10 minutes, we'll have questionnaires to discuss about the questions that participants have. And on daily basis, if you're missing the session, we'll add you to a drive, uh, just in case if you could not make it to the session and the recording will be uploaded and uh, you'll be given view only access to view the recording and you can go through that as, as per your convenient time and all the materials that we are going to use will also be uploaded to the drive so any other questions anyone uh, nice session. Uh, it was very uh, informative. Sure. Thank you. So you guys can join tomorrow's session as well if you're willing to. Uh, so first two sessions are uh, completely free and from third session uh, people who are enrolled will be can can go ahead and continue. So uh, if you are willing, you can go ahead, and go ahead and join tomorrow's session as well. Tomorrow's session will include, as I said, event types, what all event types that are included in healthcare industry and all. And uh, if you guys have don't, uh, if you guys don't have any other questions, then um, can you guys provide your email address and phone number? Uh, you guys can ping us privately on the chat so that uh, we can reach you out after the session. Okay, sure. Yeah, you can. You guys can ping your uh, phone number and email address, and then uh, can drop. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining today's session. Thank you. Hey, Jason, are you there? Hey, hey Dixon, good question. I'm sorry. Hey, Mahesh, yeah. Tell uh, me. Uh, so regarding the SQL, so what extent we have to do the SQL? So SQL, you need to know the basics of SQL, like select and uh, update commands and little bit on joins. OK. So that should be fine. OK. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, joins is enough because I mean for the at least for the initial phase Later you can have as much as complication you need when you are extracting data from database But as part of training we'll be talking about select update and uh, Join commands Okay, and you also told that the JavaScript the basic is enough. No, you got you go. Yes, JavaScript basic is enough Right. Hi, Dixon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, much. Hey, hey, Jason. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, very, very nice. Uh, the program. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. So, uh, just wanted to know. Uh, so usually we we had the introductions in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I just wanted to know if you have any healthcare background and uh, what is it that you are looking for HL7 and oh, okay. uh, what is your experience? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, R right now I'm um uh, interface analyst, and I mm -hmm. just want to, you know, you just uh, continue to um, you know get more um, information as far mm -hmm. as what other uh, interfaces are doing out there, mm -hmm. and and uh, that's that's my whole my whole goal right now. And oh. uh, I went to I took the last year. Last year, sometime I took the HL7 class, mm -hmm. and then and then I got certified in it. Um, oh, but okay. um, but right now I I'm doing um, I'm working with an interface right now. We get we're gonna integrate with a new interface right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the, um, starting it just started like today and uh, until Friday. So okay. yeah, but I, I I want to I want to um, you know uh, start the program again. The next mm -hmm. time when you have it, I want to start the the program with you, so that I can you know uh, get familiarized with other uh, interface engines and and everything. Because you okay. you have a, this program you you run it with the Merck right the the Merck yes, with Merck Connect right. Search engine, right? The uh, right. interface engine. Interface engine, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I I, I do I do want to get involved. Like you know, I want to uh, learn about that and what mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, um, the only thing is things came at a little bit of a tight time because uh, you know the um, the training is pretty heavily with this. Um, the one that I'm this interface engine that I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why I, I want to wait until the next time you have it, then I'm gonna join in. The next time I'll do the full class. Yeah. When how um how often you do it? Like every uh, every one month. Uh, so we have month. a batch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I can do the next month then. The next month when you have it, because you know that it will be too much. Like I'm, I, I don't want to get confused. I'm learning one mm -hmm. interview, face engine, and then the next, you know, and got it's kind it. of got you. Sure, sure, no problem, Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can drop your uh, email and phone number so that we mm -hmm. can be in touch with you and uh, okay. I'll let you know when the next batch starts. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Thanks uh, for joining. So, uh, Mosin, you had a question. So, on what level we stand on after completing this course on job perspective? So, the course is delivered for both from job and certification perspective, Mosin. So, once you complete it and you practice it well, uh, you will get a fair understanding of what an interface analyst would do and then what how to develop interfaces from scratch at least more than intermediate level on how do we extract data from database how do we generate hl7 messages which is a thing actually most people worry about so we are covering those topics as part of the training so that when you go for any interview you can give end-to-end -end workflow how data is extracted from database and inserted into the database as well and what are the tools that you use how do you handle complicated scenarios like um, generating hl7 messages with multiple segments and so on so all of those things will be covered. Did that answer your question, Mosin? Okay, great. All right, all right, guys. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Srinivas, you have a question? Srinivas Gupta. I think I still cannot hear you, Srinivas. Yeah, you can type your question if you have any. Uh, you said you where are the previous student? Oh, okay. Sorry. Which which month's batch you joined? When did you join? 
yeah please call me we'll talk okay if you have a number uh, please call me sure all right all right guys thank you thanks everyone for joining today's session you all have a very good day talk to you tomorrow